Good evening and uh, blessings to each and every one of you, those here in the sanctuary, those of you who have tuned in to the live streaming. We thank God for each and every one of you. Thank God for another day, for bringing us safely through another day, bringing us up until this appointed time. And thank God so much for this time of Bible study, uh, this time of coming together and continuing to study and to grow in God's word. Um, those who don't know, we are still in a pandemic, um, but God, God's word must still be declared um, because we're, we're still living in a, a, a falling world, and, and there are still a lot of people that are in desperate need of hearing the word of God and being saved um, from the wrath of God, and so we must continue to still um, declare the gospel of Christ. And so we thank God for this opportunity of allowing us to um, share again in his word. Thank God for those who um, continue to follow us live. We um, ask that you would share with somebody else, a family member, a friend, a co-worker, whoever, um, because it's, it's your way of helping to make sure that the word of God continue to go forth. And so our prayer is that as we uh, learn and study together, we'll grow together, and that we will become ambassadors um, for Christ and continue um, to share the gospel of Christ to those um, who are lost. Um, again, we thank God for this privilege. We thank God for this honor. I'm going to open up in a word of prayer, and then we'll get back into our lesson. Um, we want to um, try to leave some room for questions. I may have to change this here because these questions seem to be getting harder and harder. <laughs> <laughs> but we, we solicit um, or invite um, you to send in your questions, your comments. And we, we do this because uh, we want we want to be on one accord. We want to be on the same page. You know, we want to learn and we want to grow together. And, and the, the only dumb question that, that um, there is is the one that you never ask. Um, and so you want to you want to ask questions because you you want to know the only way to grow is that we know. And so you want to ask questions. And so we um, give you that opportunity to submit questions. We'll read them off and we try to answer as many as we could at the end. If not, we do it again next week. God's willing life last. Amen. Father God, we thank you for this time. We thank you for this opportunity and this privilege um, to come together to study your word. We thank you, God, for bringing us safely thus far up until this appointed time. And God, we're praying for the uh, perfect teaching ministry of your Holy Spirit to guide our hearts and our minds in this time of study. We pray that he would teach us, lead, guide, and direct us in this time of study, Heavenly Father, uh, that we may know that we may grow in the grace of our Lord and Savior and in the knowledge of your word, Heavenly Father. We ask uh, that your will be done in this Bible study. We pray for those that are here. We pray for those that have tuned in. God, we're praying that something will be said, something will be done that will inspire uh, us to continue um, to fight the good fight of faith. And those that uh, may not know Christ, we're praying and hoping, God, that um, they'll come to know Jesus Christ as their Lord and Savior and be saved. God, we, we thank you for this opportunity. We continue to lift up our um, sick and shed in, our bereaved families. And God, we're, we also want to lift up our senior saints, Heavenly Father, um, those who, who are not with us um, here in the sanctuary, um, who are only able to um, tune in, live stream. We um, pray, God, your blessing upon them, um, that you will continue um, to be all that they need you to be. God, we thank you. We give glory and honor. And now, God, I decrease that you will increase. Use me for your glory. Uh, use me, God, for your good purpose. I pray that your will be done in this place, Heavenly Father. I pray your will be done in each and every one of our lives. We thank you. We give glory, honor, and praise. In Jesus the Christ's name we pray. Amen and amen. All right, back to our lesson. Our lesson, if you've been with us uh, for the past couple of weeks, we've been dealing with church and membership. Um, we've, we've talked, uh, we, we defined... Um, um, uh, we defined the universal church, and, and we talked about um, the privileges. We talked about um, some obligations um, that we all have as being part of the universal church. Um, and so we, I kind of left off last week um, becoming a member. Um, how do we become um, members? 
um, those who are baptized were added, Acts 2 and 41. Then they that gladly received his word were baptized, and the same day that were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Um, Peter, Peter preached the word of God. Peter preached the word of God. Peter preached the word of God. And upon preaching the word of God, it, 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 it was the word of God. Not anything else. It was the word of God. It was the preaching of the word of God that, 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 that um, Peter preached. And after he had preached the word of God, that was added unto the church. 3,000 souls. And that is, that the, the 3,000 comes out of the great number of people that had come to Jerusalem for the Passover. It was an opportunity for God through his disciples to make known his word. And for those who were ready, willing to receive the word of God, that was added unto the church 3,000 souls. I emphasize the word of God because it's the word of God that saves souls. And, and again, as I mentioned on Sunday, as I mentioned a uh, week before last, we have to continue to declare the word of God that is what saves lives. That is what saves souls. It is, the, it is the word of God. And so we have to do that. As Paul said to Timothy, we got to do it in season. We got to do it out of season at when people want to hear it, when they don't want to hear it. Because, again, we, have, we are ambassadors for Christ. And our moral responsibility, our obligation is to say what thus says the Lord. We can, we, we're entitled to our opinions. We're entitled to whatever commentary or whatever thoughts we want to give. That's all fine. But it is the Word of God that saves souls. Nothing but the Word of God. Nothing but the Word of God. We have to, we, we have to remember, we have to remember as, as witnesses for Christ, as ambassadors for Christ, there are some who God has called to plant. There are those God has called to water. If we don't know by now, we need to pray and ask God, which one have you called me to do? So that we can be in God's will and that we can do exactly what God has called for us to do. One of the reasons why we're not seeing the increase is, first of all, we may be doing the wrong thing. Listen. There are those who want to plant water and bring about the increase. That's not what the Word of God says. It is the Word of God that saves souls. Paul says, one plant, one water, God brings about the increase. And so we have to, we, we have to be in line with what God has called us to do. We can't be watering when we should be planting. We can't be planting when we should be watering. So we need to know what it is God has called for us to do. And God is the one that brings about the increase. One of the things that has, has hurt our, our evangelizing and our witnessing, we think that every time we go out, folk are supposed to get saved right then. People are supposed to give their life to Christ right then. It doesn't always happen that way. It doesn't. That, there are days when we go out when we are just planning. That's it. That's it. That's, that's why we have to pray and get guidance from God, because God sends us where he wants us to go. That way we'll see the harvest. We got to do it as God has called for us to do it. And there are days when we were just simply water. You know how many, listen. Pastor Johnson preached and taught here at Ebenezer. For 40 years. For 40 years. And, and in that 40 year period, not everybody who came down these aisles came because he preached the word. Some came because of the word that he preached to others and they went and watered somewhere else. You know how many times he probably sat here and preached a message 
Uh, and, and, and people have heard it time and time again, and then someone else come in, and they say the very same thing that he said. <laughs> you know, sometimes you sitting back, are, are you kidding me? You know how many times I done stood up and said that? But you learn through the course of time, and when you, and when you have a better understanding of the word, you understand now why that happened. Because at the time, he was just playing. And someone came and watered. We have to know where it is God is calling us to be and what it is he's calling us to do. Peter declared the word of God. He didn't preach what he thought. He didn't preach what, 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 what he thought the word should have been. He simply preached the word of God. And God moved on the multitude of people, and that were added to the church. 3,000 souls in that, in that one day, that were added 3,000 souls. Those being saved were added by the Lord. See, there we go right there. Those that were being saved were added by the Lord to his church. Church belongs to God. God is the one who brings in. Acts 2 and 47. Praising God and having favor with all people, all and the Lord added to the church daily, such as should be saved. <laughs> God knows when the hearts are right and conditioned for saving. Think about, think about it. How many Sundays we came to church and we sat here and we heard the message and we would say, you know, I'm, when I go back to church, I'm doing it this time. I'm going I'm to go down the aisles the next time when I, when I come to church. But it, but it wasn't until God had appointed the time for us to come down these aisles. It was an appointed time. And when that time had came, had come, uh, we, had, we had two choices. We could get up and move at the unction of the Holy Spirit, or we could reject what the Holy Spirit was doing. But the only way we can come according to the Word of God is that the Holy Spirit draws us. And when the time is right, and when God, and when God has appointed a set time, that's the time we came. That, that, is, that is the time, and that's why the, the planting and the watering is so important. If we just continue to plant and we just continue to water, God, 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 God will bring them in due time. He'll bring them in due time, but we got to continue to plant, and we got to continue to water. The early church was an evangelizing church, growing daily. That's why they grew, because they were an evangelizing church. They declared what they had been taught. They declared what they had learned. They didn't just sit on it. They were an evangelizing church. And because they were, God added to the church daily. He added to the church daily. The crucifixion and the resurrection of Christ were at the heart of the early Christians. It was at the heart, it was at the heart of the early Christian preaching which called for immediate response from everyone who listened. It was at the heart. They were ready and conditioned. They, they, in other words, they wanted to hear the gospel. They came to hear the gospel. We come to church just to come to church. You got to want to come to church for more than that. You got to come to church because of the benefits of what we're going to receive upon coming to church. First of all, we're going to receive the word of God that is good for the saving of your soul. That's in a class all by itself. I just, I just said to you what was at the heart of the early Christians, the crucifixion and the resurrection was at the heart of the preaching of Christ. And they, they willingly received and accepted that. It's more than just us coming to church. There are great benefits in us being here. 
But if we're coming just to come to church and that's it, that's all we get. We don't get the benefits of what God has in store for us in coming. By one spirit, they were baptized into one body, the church. 1 Corinthians 12, 13. For by one spirit are we all baptized into one body, whether we be Jews or Gentiles, whether we be bond or free, and have been made, have been all made to drink into one spirit. To illustrate uh, that individual believers became, become identified as one body of Christ, as the unified church, Paul borrowed imagery from the practice of dyeing various clothes by immersing, which is the Greek word baptizo, them into um, the same divat. To show that we're all one in Christ, he took various pieces of clothes and put them all in the same dye. I told you, we're, when, when, we're, when we're here, we're all in the same boat. We're, we're, we're one body. And I said to y'all last week, I said it again. When Christ returns, he's not, he's not returning for Ebenezer. He's not returning for the church of God. He's not returning for the Catholic. He's returning for the body of believers, those who have professed Christ and those who have stayed the course. That's who he's coming back from. For a church, the body of Christ, without spot or without wrinkle. That's who he's coming back for. And so if, 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 if we're going to return with him, we need to grasp the concept that we're all one in the body of Christ. There, there, all, 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 although we have individual tasks, we're all one body. The individual tasks are simply uh, given to us so that we can all come together. Because it takes all of our individualism to come together to make one body of Christ. It takes all of us working together, doing our part, our individual part. And until we can do that, we'll stay fragmented. We'll continue to be at odds with one another. And the body will continue to suffer. Until we learn how to come together. I'm t- I, I, I know you, it, that there, there are three, three words in the entire Bible that sums up the whole Bible. Love, unity, and forgiveness. Sums up the whole Bible. Love, unity, and forgiveness. God is love. Christ preached unity and forgiveness for the whole three and a half years he walked the earth. And that, is, that, 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 that makes up the whole Bible. Those are the three words that we struggle with more than anything. Those three words have kept us bound up for years because of our refusal to love one another to forgive one another, and to unite with one another. And you have folks sitting up in church Sunday after Sunday shouting hallelujah, praising and glorifying God in their mind, and still struggling with forgiveness, forgiveness, with love and unity. But in their mind, they going to heaven anyhow. I'm not the judge. I'm not the jury. But the Bible tells us this, that if we judge any man, that we judge according to the word of God. Jesus says, you will know his by the fruit that they're bearing. And we can fool ourselves and to think that we're on our way to glory. 
and end up missing the mark. Matthew says in 7 that there are going to be many crying, Lord, Lord, won't make it in. And so we have to make sure that we're on point with what we're doing and who we're doing it for. We're one body with many members. And until we learn to unite and come together as one, our struggles will continue. We read throughout the Bible and we see all of the things that they did in the early church. And at some point, we have to ask ourselves, what makes church so different now than it was then? It's still church. It's the attitude that they had for church and for Christ and the attitudes that we have for church and for Christ. Just as I mentioned on Sunday that if we really love the Lord, then we'll be doing the things that pleases God. And nobody has to always be compelling us to do the things that are pleasing to God because we love God so much and because we appreciate how good God has been to us. Uh, nobody should have to tell us Titus 3 and 5, this is why nobody should have to tell us. Not by works of righteousness, which we have done, but according to his mercy, he saved us. By the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Some interpreters have understood this verse as saying that baptism causes salvation. But in the context, human works are clearly downplayed. And the emphasis is on divine action and initiative. The washing described here is the spiritual cleansing that is symbolized outwardly by water baptism. We're saved by grace. It is the gift of God, not of works. None of us have been saved by works. That's why no one should have to tell us to do the things that are pleasing to God, because if God saved us by his mercy and by his grace, we ought to be thankful and we ought to, we ought to, we ought to willingly accept every opportunity that we have to do what is pleasing unto God. When Paul came into the understanding of God's mercy and God's grace, he sold himself out based on that alone. That's why Paul reminds the people that I was the chief of sinners. I persecuted the church. If anybody knew how to sin, I was the chief of them. But, when, but, but the grace that God bestowed upon me, Paul says, it was not in vain. Because I'm doing whatever I can to declare the gospel of Christ if it kills me. Paul sold out for the he sold out for the gospel of Christ. That's why in, in Ephesians 1, he opened up, I'm a prisoner in bond for Christ, for life. There is nothing any of us could have done to be saved by God's grace. Nothing, nothing we could have done. Not by works, but it was by the amazing grace of of God that he saved us, the washing of regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Ghost, followed by the outward, outward expression of water baptism. That's what the baptism is all about. It's an outward expression demonstrating what we have accepted now in Christ, the death, the burial, the resurrection, and the ascension. And we show that outwardly by water baptism.
is symbolized the regenerating, the regeneration and the renewing of the Holy Spirit uh, once we are baptized. One becomes a member of the church universal when they are saved. You cannot be a member of the universal church, the body of Christ, until you have been saved, not baptized, not becoming a member of a church. You cannot become a member of the universal church until you have been saved. That is the only way. John says you must be born again. That is the new birth. You must be born again. And then you must confess Romans 10, 9 and 10. And the Bible says that you shall be saved. But you got to be saved. And it's just that simple. It's just, it's just that simple. Confess and believe and you shall be saved. But you cannot be a part of the universal church. In other words, you can't be talking about going to heaven and you're not saved. You got to be saved. You, you, must, you must be saved. As the songwriter says, you can't go over. You can't go under. <laughs> you can't go around it. You must come in at the door. And that's Jesus Christ. You got to be saved. You must be saved. When you have confessed Romans 10, 9 and 10, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus and shalt believe in thine heart that God has raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. For the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. And verse 13, for whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. It's just that simple. There are some folk who will tell you differently, but that's not what the word of God says. That's the word of God. That, that, that tells us exactly how to be saved. No, no strings attached, but you must be saved. If one wishes to be a member of the church universal, they need, first of all, to obey the gospel of Christ in faith, repentance, and baptism. Mark 16, 15 and 16. And he said unto them, go ye into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He that believeth and, and is baptized shall be saved, but he that believeth not shall be damned. Our responsibility is to go and declare the gospel of Christ. We can't make people accept it, but once we declare it, then we've done what was required of us. It's a matter of what they do with what they receive now. We can't force it on them. We can't make them accept it. The only thing we have been called to do is to declare it to a dying world. And when we have done that, we have done what is required of us. Now it's a matter of what you do with what you receive. Just like on Sunday mornings when we hear the word of God, on Tuesdays when we hear um, the word of God taught, it's a matter of what we do with what we've heard now. We may be saved, but we still have work to do. And so through the preaching and to the, through the teaching, consistently of God's word, it, 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 it gives us what we need to continue to do what God is calling for us to do. It's a matter of what we do with what we receive. The more you know, the more you grow. Acts 2, 38 to 41. Then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin. And ye shall receive the gifts of the Holy Ghost. For the promise is unto you and to your children and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. 
And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this uh, untoward generation. Then they gladly received his word, were baptized, and the same day there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Upon hearing, that must be repentance followed by baptism. And repentance is one of those words we don't hear enough and we don't talk about it enough. But in the simplest definition, repentance is a turning away from. It is a 360 degree turnaround. From whatever it is, you just confessed and asked God to forgive you for. See, forgiveness is one thing, but repentance is another thing. God says that if you confess your sins, I'm faithful and just to forgive you. I forgive you. And so God says confess. But repentance must always be followed. By confession. Because if there is no repentance, then the confession wasn't genuine. God's, God's part is genuine. God says, I forgive you. God, God, God is true to what he says. But the condition of forgiveness is the repentance. We have the, that, that has to be repentance. Because without repentance, guess what? You're going to find yourself going back to God, asking for forgiveness for the same thing. But when we understand what what repentance is, repentance is a turning away from. That thing that that I've confessed unto God, I'm turning away from it. And, and, And then you have to pray and ask God to give you the strength to keep you from that. But until you repent, It's going to keep showing up, and we'll keep going back to God for the same old thing. But they confessed, they repented, and they were baptized, and that were added to the church that same day, 3,000 souls. And once that happens, um, they are ready to become members of the universal church. In the local church definition, the local church, ecclesia, it's a group of Christians who meet and work together. The church, the ecclesia, the members who come to the local church, ah, we meet and we work together uh, to upbuild God's kingdom. And the only way we can do that is that we do it together. First Thessalonians 1 and 1, Paul and Savannah and Timothy unto the church of the Thessalonians, which is in God the Father and in the Lord Jesus Christ. But grace be unto you and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ. God, Paul sends these greetings from him and Savannah and Timothy unto the church. And it was, in, it was in demonstration to let the church know that we are together in the greeting that we're sending. To also uh, illustrate to the church their need to come together and to work together. Paul and Savannah and Timothy were working together for the cause of Christ. Three different people, three different backgrounds, three different upbringings, but they came together for the cause of Christ. We, can, we continue, we continue to use the excuse that we're all different, 
that we all have our, our, our different abilities and whatever. We continue to use that for, for excuses when that is the sole reason of why God is telling us to come together. Because we're different. If every one of us was bringing to the same thing to the table, how, 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 what kind of benefit, what is that going to profit us? If all of us coming to the table doing the same thing, that doesn't profit us anything. It doesn't profit God anything. God made us different for a reason. Now it is up to us to use our individuality to come together to do the greater good for the cause of Christ. And I said this before, and I'll just simply say it again. We're that much better when we do it together than we are when we do it individually. God has called us to do some individual things. But he's also called for us to do some collective things, some corporate things together as a body of believers. There are some things that we can't do individually that requires all of us to do. And those are the things that God is calling us to do. Corporately together. But Paul wanted the church to know that even before they got there, we're working together. And so that they would be on one accord in their work. And when Paul did come to Thessalonica, um, he would find them doing what they were already doing. And when you read in Ephesians, the church at Thessalonica, it's exactly what they were doing. And the, and, and the key to what they were doing, they were doing it before Paul even got there, just based on what Paul had wrote and said to them. He came and found them working together, helping one another, and believing together before he even got there. And Paul was encouraged. He was encouraged by it, and, and he further encouraged them to continue. And again, remember, they're, they're being persecuted, and they're doing this here. Hmm. Not, no, we don't face that kind of persecution. We don't, we, don't, we, don't, we, don't, we don't face that kind of persecution. We come up in here on Sunday morning and you got some um, um, rebels up in here telling us, I, you know, y'all come up in here on, this morning, you, it may end your life. You got folk who couldn't get out of this parking lot fast enough. And that seems to be the problem with the Christian faith. That the minute our faith is challenged, we want to turn and run the other way. When we can come in here on Sunday morning and have church freely, we're fine. But you let that service be disrupted. And folk will get out of here real fast. There are many such churches, not just one. Romans 16, 16, salute one another with a holy kiss. The churches of Christ salute you. Paul was simply saying that whatever local church you are a part of, you're not the only one. Paul, Paul, Paul says to salute one another. All who have professed Christ as Lord and Savior are now adopted into the family of God. And so that makes us brothers and sisters in Christ, in the body of Christ, where God is our Father. And so Paul says to salute one another. Just because you are of di different denominations, you're still the body of Christ. God, God is the one that's going to do the separating. And so Paul says, salute one another with a Christ. But one of the reasons why we can't come, to nation, come together as denominations because we've allowed denominations to separate us. We do, we, we've allowed different beliefs to separate us. As if, as if there's one body of Christ here, there's one body of Christ here. God is not coming back. I wish all the churches could. God is not coming back for multiple churches. When God talks in terms of church, he's talking about one church. Paul says here, salute the churches. 
because there's more than just you. It's one body, but it's more than just one you. We have brothers and sisters all over the world. And some of those, some of our brothers and sisters are dying because of persecution on our behalf. That's why, that's why you ought to make sure when you pray that you incorporate them in your prayers because they are, they are literally dying for your cause and for the cause of Christ. We would simply say, well, why don't they just leave? Because it ain't just that simple. It's not that simple. Hmm. The day is coming and it's fastly approaching. When every believer, everyone that profess Christ is going to have to show where their faith lies and who their faith lies in. Every one of us, every, 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 la- the day is coming because, because if you think that we're going to always have these iPads and these iPhones and these Bibles at our, at our disposal, you're sadly mistaken. That's why if you go all the way back to Deuteronomy, when God gave Moses the law, he says, to tie it upon your doorpost, to teach your children that they will teach your children, and to make sure they get it in their heart. Because the day and time is coming when that is the only way you're going to be able to stand is that the Word of God is within you, right where the kingdom of God is. That's why the disciples couldn't get it, because when Jesus was talking about the kingdom of God, he was talking about within. The kingdom is within us. And so the only way you're going to be able to stand, we're living in, we're, we're living comfortably right now, even in the midst of this pandemic, because there's nothing threatening our faith right now. There's nothing threatening our faith. They never told us we couldn't come to church. They just said to be mindful of how we congregate. They never said that we couldn't come to church. But some people took that as, oh, nah, we can't have church. We can't, we can't go to church. No, we can't. They never, they never said that. The only thing they did was put guidelines in place. I met with on, on, on video calls with the city of Hollandale, with the commissioners, with the mayor, and they went over the things that they were asking the churches to do because they didn't want to get involved with what the church was doing. They never said we couldn't have church. But many people took it as we can't have church. Listen, the day and time is coming when the true believers, just as, just, just, just as, just as Jesus said in John chapter 4, the day and time is come. God is seeking for the true worshipers, and that day and time is fastly approaching. We've been living comfortable for quite a while, for quite a while. And if, and if all of what's going on now has not awakened something in you to tell you that the day and time is coming, when Paul says like this, for Christ I live and for Christ I die, that day is fastly approaching. When our faith is really going to be put to the test. It's coming. It's coming. And it's coming for all of us. And we're going to have to, we're going to have to at that moment declare on whose side we stand. All of the church we done had over all these years ain't going to matter one bit because that's going to be the defining moment of who we live for and who we're willing to die for. And history has taught us that many of those instances has already taken place. You can go all the way back to Columbine. And so that day is fastly approaching. And so the local church is is, is members who meet and work together for the cause of Christ. To learn, to grow together, 
that we may better be able to do the things that God is calling us for us to do so that when he returns, we will be found doing what God has called for us to do. That we're not laboring in vain. We hear, we hear the song, may the works I've done speak for me, and we get just as happy as we want. We get as happy as we want. We'll, we'll shout all over the church. And some folk ain't even start working yet. But the minute we're laid out here, we want that to be said over our life. That the work we done will speak for us. That's where we are. And if you want your works to speak for you, then you got to get busy. You got to get busy working for the Lord. And if you're working, if you're doing work for the Lord, your works will speak for you. They, they will, they will speak for you. One more, and then I guess it's about time for some questions. Uh, Acts 9.31. Then had the churches, what? watch this. Then had the churches rest throughout all Judea and Galilee and Samaria and were edified and walking in the fear of the Lord and in the comfort of the Holy Ghost were multiplied. They had rest throughout the land, and God was continuing to add to the church daily. Because, their, because of their willingness to hear, to receive the word, and then to share the word of God with others, God had them in a place of, of rest, and he continued to add to the church daily. When we are busy doing what God has called us to do as a body, God will do his part. I, 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 you know, I said this and I keep, and I keep saying this. I keep, I, keep saying, I keep saying the same thing again. You know, we, 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 we continue to invite people who are supposed to be saved to church. Saved folk can't be no more saved than they are. If they're already saved, they can't. Jesus says, I come not to call the righteous, but the, but the lost. Saved folk can't be no more saved than they are. If they're already saved, they ought to be bringing somebody that's not saved. The Bible says, go out into the hedges, into the highway, and compel folk to come. One of the reasons why people ain't coming to church, we ain't inviting them to church. Invite them. Some folk will tell you, well, I, I, you know, I don't go. I ain't nobody never asked me to go. That, that's bad. That, that's bad to hear someone say, well, I don't go to church because nobody ain't ever asked me to go to church. You got to go and compel them to come. If you don't ask them, they probably won't come. But we can't keep asking saved folk to go to church. We, you know, that's like church robbing. We, we want to take Folk from other churches that belong to other churches and make them become members of a guy. You know how many say unsaved people in the world? All righty. That's a whole nother lesson. <laughs> that's a whole nother. That's a whole nother lesson. Because we got folk who come into church and they get busy for Christ and and, and it's some of the saved folk who run them out. Who they think they are? They coming in here trying to do this and trying to do that. People trying to get busy. And we want to stop them. And we wonder why they leave and don't come back. Anyway, that's a whole nother lesson. Do we have questions tonight? <laughs> I don't know why I asked that question. I'm ready when y'all ready. <laughs> All right, question number one. Whew. If planting and watering are interchangeable and are seasonal, should we be able, should we be concerned with numbers in the local church? Not necessarily. 
Because if we're busy watering and if we're busy planning, God will bring about the increase and we won't even realize he done did it. All we need to do is just focus on the task at hand. And people will begin to come. People, people will begin. God will, God will begin to bring about increase. And what God is going to, what, what God begins to do is, is those people that we probably witnessed to years ago will come walking in the door. Because remember, God has, God has an appointed time. But if we're busy doing what God has called us to do, and, and if you notice, when I, when I, when I read those scriptures in, in, in Acts and in Mark, when, 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 when God added to the church, he did it the same day. He did it the same day. Pre, Peter preached the word, and on the same day, God added 3,000 souls to the church. On the same day. On the same day. And so when, we're, when, we, when we get busy doing what God has called us to do, and that's what our focus is, is, is on the task at hand, God will, God will start sending. God, God will start sending people in. He'll start, he'll start sending them. And so we, we, don't, we, don't have to, we don't have to concern ourselves, you know, uh, with, 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 with the number of people who is coming up who, who, ha- who are not coming. Because, again, remember, God, God doesn't deal in numbers the way we deal with numbers. You know, God, God, God will take 50 members and do what 500 can't do or what 500 won't do. He don't require your numbers that way. All God needs is a willing heart. All he needs is a willing heart. And God will accomplish more with a few. The Bible gives us great illustrations of that. God will accomplish much more with few than he will with a greater number. Y'all do remember. <laughs> Ooh, Lordy. Um, let me get that. Woo. God, God, God doesn't require numbers that way. He, he doesn't require numbers that way. Uh, but when we get busy doing what God has called us to do, he'll, he'll, he'll add. He'll add to the church. And God will, God will bring workers um, who are willing to work for him. And, and, and you, you talk about um, being in a pandemic. This is, <laughs> this is and, 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 and a lot of people probably don't even realize it. Even though we're in the midst of a pandemic, th- this is harvest season for the Lord. It's harvest time. It's ripe for the picking. I'm ready. You can put it back up. I'm ready. I'm ready. Oh, Lordy. Why is it so hard to achieve unity in the body of Christ? Seems we work extra hard at dividing rather than coming together. It's always more work dividing than it is to come together. I, I mentioned earlier the only the only reason why we don't come together in unity is because we continue to use the excuse that we're different. Well, we're we're different because God didn't make us the same, and God is using our individuality um, to perfect to perfect us. And the reason for that is because not one of us bring everything that the body of Christ needs. I know there's a whole lot of folk who think they do, but there's not one person. That question was asked when we was in seminary. You remember, why do we have four Gospels? Well, because one Gospel writer couldn't tell the whole story about Christ. And so it took all four of them, but it took all four of them writing to come together as one. And they wrote differently. The same story to different audience, but it presents one Christ. And so, (laughs) oh yeah. (laughs) 
we, we, we tend to think we might be lacking something if we give up more than required of us. And, and that, that's, why, that's why if you remember back when we talked about breaking some bad habits, we got, we got to break some of those bad habits. We got we to gotta get out of that way of thinking. Remember, that, that's why John says you have to be born again. If you, if, you, if, you, if you confess Christ as your Lord and Savior, you believe in your heart you, and you're saved, then John says now you have to be born again. And that means that God need, you, you have to allow God to renew your mind now. Because until God begins to renew your mind, you're going to continue to think. God doesn't save you, but because your mind is not being renewed, you're still thinking the same way. And until your mind is being renewed, you'll never be able to come together in unity and work with other believers because of your way of thinking. I'm doing more than they're doing. So what? To whom much is given, much is required. Not all of us bring the same abilities to the table. Some bring more. And so if we bring more, then more is required. We got to stop looking at what other people are doing or what other people are not doing. And if we focus on what we're supposed to be doing, we'll accomplish a whole lot more. There's enough to be done for everybody to just focus on what they need to be doing. I can't be concerned about what I got a whole lot on my plate. I can't be concerned about what everybody else is doing. And so we got to be concerned with what it is we're supposed to be doing. And if we concern ourselves with what we're supposed to be doing and everybody else is doing that, I can assure you we'll meet together right where God would have us to be if everybody would do that. God gave us grace according to our measure of faith. And Paul says, as you read down in that, in, that, in that 12th chapter, for us not to think more highly of ourselves than we ought to. Bring to the table what God has given you to bring, and, 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 and you don't have to worry about no more than that. See, that's what, that's what we miss. That's what, that's what we miss. And that's the reason why we're so overworked. Because most of the time we're doing what we shouldn't even be doing. Just do what God has given you to do, and that's all you have to worry about. Ah, that's another lesson. I'm just saying. God is, God, in other words, what God is doing is God is taking the pressure off of us for trying to do everything to be trying to be everything to everybody. He's taking the pressure off of us and he's spreading it out so that we can do it all together. Oh Lordy. Y'all gonna I'm I, okay, give me give me another question here. Gotcha. <laughs> oh Lordy. I'm <laughs> oh my. I could I could just stay right there. How likely is it for believers to get divine direction mixed up with personal ambition? How can we avoid that rap? If, oh, trap. How can we avoid that trap? If we're confusing divine direction with our personal ambition, then it ain't divine direction. <laughs> it's just your ambition getting in the way. Because you're never going to get divine direction as long as your personal ambitions is in the forefront. God, God ain't going God ain't gonna cause no more confusion than you already have right now. Because the only thing that's going to happen if God gives you divine direction in the midst of your personal ambition is now you're going to question whether or not it's even divine direction. Whenever God gives us divine direction, God usually has us in a place to receive it so that there is no question as to who's giving it. God ain't getting in the way of you and your ambition. Divine direction is given for a specific purpose. 
It's given for a specific person, purpose. It's, it's a specific task that God has personally called for you to do, and he don't need anything or anybody in the way of that. And so if your ambitions are in the way, God is not giving you divine direction. You got to get your, your ambition out of the way if you're going to hear from God. God is not the author of confusion. And so anything you're confused about, you got to know it ain't from God. He is not the author of confusion. God is not going to do anything if you're in a place where it's going to cause you to be confused. He's not going to do that. God always brings us to a place where he can get our full attention. Okay, that's another lesson. I, got, I, done, I done got whew, about, a, about four or five lessons out of one course. I'm, I'm ready. <laughs> All right, this is the last one because it's 8 o'clock. Um, should repentance be immediate or is it something or is it sometimes a process? Repentance if, if we're confessing our sins, repentance should be followed immediately after confession. Upon confessing our sins, we need to also confess repentance. And so that should follow immediately. Repentance is not a process. Repentance is something that you make the decision right then to do. Huh? Before you not 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 only before you fall off, but before you fall completely off. That's why the, that's why the confession needs needs to follow up immediately, because once 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 we confess and once we repent, the repentance is designed to remind us of what we just confessed unto the Lord that God has just forgiven us for. And so, and so because we confessed and because we repented doesn't mean it's not going to come. But now we have, we have something to stand on. Now we have something to help us to fight. I just confessed to God and I just repented to God. Lord, give me the strength to turn from this thing here. And so when it comes again, it reminds me, that, well, let me, let me just back up. The Spirit reminds me of the confession I just made and the repentance. And so when He reminds me of that, He also reminds me I'm your help. That's all the Spirit is doing. I'm, he's reminding me, I'm your help. Now you have to trust me to give you what you need. But it is a turning away from. And so when it comes, turn your back on it and go the other way. And if need be, just cry out unto the Lord. Just as Peter did when he was singing, Lord, help me. But we'll get to those verses next week. Thank God for this time. Thank God for this opportunity. Thank God for each and every one of you. We're praying that something was said or done that has inspired you, something um, that has provoked you uh, to want to now get busy for the Lord. And those of you who have never accepted Christ as your Lord and Savior, we're praying that something has inspired you, that something has ignited in you, um, a desire to know the Lord Jesus Christ as your personal Savior. And again, as I mentioned, uh, Romans 10, 9 and 10, if you confess with your mouth, believe in your heart, the Lord Jesus, that God has raised him from the dead, the Bible says that you shall be saved. And in verse number 13, it says, whosoever call upon the Lord. So right in your living room, wherever you are tuned into this library, if you confess that, and if you call upon the name of the Lord, confessing that, the Bible says, then you shall be saved. 
And so that's all that's all that's required. And 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 if you do that, then we ask when 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 whenever um, the opportunity presents itself to you to uh, find you a local assembly where you can go and show outwardly um, by baptism what you have confessed to, um, uh, then 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 I ask that you would do that. Um, but there's no greater greater joy. Uh, then to give your life to the Lord, I said time and time again concerning me um, that 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 I didn't begin to live life until I began to live life in Christ. That's 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 me. That's my personal testimony. The life that I now live in Christ is far better than the life that I lived before Christ. It's far better, and 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 and. And because of the life that I now live in Christ, I, 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 have, I, I'm, I'm, I, I have benefits to so much more now, to so much more now that I didn't have. And so I thank God for that. Again, thank God for each and every one of you. Uh, we pray God's blessings upon you, upon your family, upon your household. Let us close out in a word of prayer. Father God, we thank you for this time and for this opportunity to come together to share and to study your word. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the presence of your Holy Spirit leading and guiding and directing us in this time of study. We thank you, Heavenly Father, for all that you've imparted unto us. And we are praying now, God, that with what you've given unto us, we'll go and share it with others. We pray, God, for every family, for every household that you would just continue to bless. We pray for all of our sick and shed in. We pray for our bereaved families. And God, we continue to lift up our leadership. We continue to lift up this nation. God, we're praying your will be done in earth as it is in heaven. We pray also, God, for travel and mercy as we depart from this place. Keep your hedge of protection around us. Keep us from hurt, harm, and danger that we may arrive at our destination safely. And as we do, God, we'll continue to give you all the praise, honor, and glory that you're so worthy of. It is in the name of Jesus the Christ we pray. Amen. Amen.